Namaskar and good afternoon everyone. Honorable Vice Chancellor Sir, Register Sir, Controller of Examination Sir, Finance Officer Sir, Directors of different schools of Krishnagol Tahol Dikoy State of Bay University, faculty members and other family members of Krishnagol Tahol Dikoy State of Bay University. From today, we are reviving our old and tradition, our old traditions and which is, which is very healthy to organize monthly academic talk uh, among the family members of our university in order to provide a platform for accumulations and sharing the knowledge. And today's and today Professor Zoidi Purvasar will deliver a lecture on rethinking development. Many a times uh, a, a question come to our mind are we at the right path of development? And I think and I believe from today's lecture, we will get a right path to introspect these questions. With this, I request Jari Borwa sir to start his talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor sir, Register sir, uh, Finance Officer to Kolkata and uh, Controller of Examination and my colleagues. Uh, it is uh, both a privilege and also a responsibility to start a program and which is actually of academic nature. And I am rather privileged to be given this task of you know, you know, giving the first talk. And I will be speaking about development and uh, sort of critically looking at development trying to answer certain questions because this is the topic that I know most. For last two decades and more than that, I have been doing some exercises indirectly or directly related to the question of development and I had the rare occasion of dealing at different levels starting from grassroots to the government. And uh, that is how I uh, see the issues related to development and I rather would like to reflect that how these uh, questions can be answered and why we need to answer certain questions. Um, what I will try to do uh, in this uh, talk, uh, I will be speaking about uh, roughly 40-45 minutes uh, and then I will be more interested to take questions and discussions. Uh, what is uh, important is to understand, you know, I put three specific questions and I will come back to these questions once again and once I finish the presentation. Um, the first question is that why should we think about development? Is there any reason for it? And to, to frame it differently, is there any legitimate reasons for rethink, uh, to rethink about development? So that is one of the things that I would like to deal, on, deal with. And uh, if we find that there is actually a reason for rethinking development, then I will try to also look at the question that what should be those things that why we should, uh, how we should actually rethink about development. Um, the, we will try to look at the contemporary things and then I will try to also throw up in order to provoke uh, certain questions that uh, how a possible alternative can possibly be emerged. Uh, so these are the two central themes where I will try to restrict myself and then on and off I will also try to address related questions and themes. Let me you know give a very common kind of understanding which we normally call GDP per capita you know and then if we look at the GDP per capita then we will see that uh, last uh, centuries or so there is an enormous increase in GDP per capita across the different countries. And if you look at the diagram, then you will see that the Western countries, Western Europe, and starting from Africa, even Africa, although we know that these countries are more or less poor countries, but there also you will find that there is a trend of upward you know, uh, GDP per capita, and that is what is the common understanding is all about. And we said that over the last few centuries, we are actually growing, economy is going, people of, you know, life of people are getting better and better and so on and so forth. So we are actually having a sense of development in this fashion that over the period our lives are being better, 
uh, qualities of life being improved and so on. And therefore, this is the traditional or standard way of looking at the things. And one particular thing which is a very hegemonic in nature is the idea of growth. And then overall growth and also the GDP per capita. Um, I would also like to put another, uh, you know, the picture of this. What this first picture hides all about is the this picture. The share of that GDP that goes to profit and wage. If we look at the, the graph for this, then you will find during the same period where we have tremendous growth in terms of GDP per capita and also in terms of GDP as, as, a, as, as a whole, then you will find that in the same period there is a constant increase in the share of profit and there is also a constant decline in the share of wages. So that is the picture normally we do not talk about, uh, we do not uh, like to put into the, uh, in the, in the public domain uh, and because it is actually going to question the first picture itself that what kind of growth it is all about where not everybody is being better off equally, not being, uh, you know, not everybody is getting the same kind of share. So that picture we don't, we normally do not talk about. Of late we are talking about those inequalities and all, starting with Oxfam report in a private domain and academically after the PKT has written his, you know, the two books about the economic inequality. So this, this is what is the probably sets the tone of this talk that what is presented before you in terms of economic development hides many things which are not being presented before you. So that's the way uh, to look at the thing and that is why we should probably rethink about development. That what is presented before us in the form of development needs a lot of introspection and questioning and then probably we should actually look back and th rethink about development. So that's the you know, broadly kind of first argument that we would like to put forth. Uh, I'll come back to this share, declining share of wages and then increasing share of profit uh, in order to explain the kind of situation that we have today, why we are not having the, the e e demand coming up in the economy, uh, even though there is a, you know, there is a resumption of economic activities post pandemic situation because precisely why the most of the people do not actually have income to spend so that's where an income gets concentrated only on at a, at a few hands so that's the reason that is why the demand is not coming up and it is not being matched up with the economic growth so that i will come to later now i will put three four you know broad ideas to start with uh, it is very interesting that development is what we call essentially contested idea. Now what is this essentially contested idea? That everybody has a common sense of the term and everybody has their own kind of idea regarding development. If you ask people, go on asking people and that is what we, we did. They are asking people about their kind of idea of development. Everybody has their own version of development. Alright, so that is why uh, they have their own idea. It is essentially contested idea. It is one of those ideas where people have their own kind of imagination. For instance, democracy, if you go on asking different people what do you mean by democracy, they will have their own version to tell. Similarly, if you go on asking people about development, the people have their own version to tell about what, what constitutes development and what constitutes better life and so on and so forth. And there are enormous differences. If you ask, suppose, people living in uphill areas, which we normally call tribal people, they will not probably say the things which they mean by development that will be, you know, commonly available in a place. So therefore, in terms of geography, in terms of communities, in terms of countries, you get actually a sense that people have their own version of idea of development and that is the first point you need to understand. So that is, that is what we call essentially contested, you know, the idea. It is always contested. Now very interestingly, even if people have their own versions of their development idea, somehow at some point of time, the one particular idea of development gets standardized. So that is the you know, one thing that we need to understand. How come, given this plurality of idea of development, one idea gets standardized and it dominates the discourse of development? So that's the second point we need to understand. And that is what is one of my theme, or rather central theme of talking about. And if we actually fixed and standard that this is the standard idea immediately it creates a converse 
that what is not standard is actually converse and that is how we have these two idea of development and underdeveloped coming up and if we see that uh, for instance suppose if we think that okay the investment and industrialization is actually linked to the idea of development then lack of industrialization and lack of infrastructure lack of investment will be typifying the lack of development so therefore once we set a standard immediately it produces interestingly a, a converse as an absence of that particular you know standardization and when that happens and then we need to understand that how that stereotyping is actually accomplished in terms of theory in terms of model in terms of path in terms of policy so that is very important to understand that even if people have their own kind of understanding regarding their uh, the development what constitutes their development yet they be become victim of a dominant idea of development and they have to surrender their understanding of development they have to confirm what is being given as a standard and anything which is missing in that standard will be constituting the lack of development and that will they will be projected as underdeveloped kind of thing and then we will try to make them development so that is what is the is the dominant discourse is all about that you have to actually you know make people development rather than considering their idea of development allowing people to develop themselves there will be a standard idea and then we will consider that okay these people are actually underdeveloped because they are not conforming to the standard we have set in and then it is our duty actually to make them develop so that's the normal development economics talks about and that is what is the agenda of that dominant discourse so therefore it is important to understand that why and how given the plurality of idea of development one idea gets standardized it gets actually stereotyped and then it is becoming an exogenous development which is being thrust upon people and which is being thrust upon countries which is being thrust upon different societies so that answer probably lie in history okay so i i i i will not be able to explain everything that is there or nor do i know everything which is available so i will take a middle path of this the what i know and how, how i want to present it i find six things very important in this answering this question one that it is important to understand the difference between other animal and human human is the only animal which can produce things for themselves no animal can produce things for themselves they will be taking whatever it is available human is the only animal which can produce so human society the production becomes distinguishing factor from other animal beings so that's the first point we need to understand so activity wise this activity of production is unique and elementarily fundamental in human society that distinguishes human being from animal so that's the first point you need to understand second if we put a centrality of production in human society then immediately it becomes very important who produces what immediately we have who produces what and that is how society is organized uh, and then uh, then Im immediately we will that that is the idea actually this is the first chapter of wealth of nation uh, division of labor and that is why probably adam smith talked about that this is one of the central feature of human society that human society essentially is divided society and it is divided on the basis of a fundamental activity which is production and the question of that division actually relates to who produces what so that is how society is organized very simple society everybody are engaged in every activities as society progresses and it becomes complex then no individual can produce everything he has to specialize that is how these divisions get tightened and that is how it is it is gone you know it gets more solidified it gets more fused and that is how it it becomes very in you know, a complex kind of society to understand and it is also important to understand that once we get you know the complex kind of division it is increasingly becoming complex to answer the who gets what because you need all the things you are not producing everything you are getting solidified in one or two activities so you need but you need all the activities so therefore the question immediately becomes very evident that once i restrict myself to one kind of activities whereas i need all the kinds of products available produced by other things 
then my kind of share, my kind of stake, how it will be defined over other production, which I am not a part of it. So that's the second question, which is very important, that what I am engaged with, all right, that is the division of labor. And then second part is that how do I claim a stake of the commodities which I need for myself, which are not being produced by me, but by somebody else. So how do you define that stake? So who gets what? Who, who is going to decide on that? So human society gets entrapped in two questions that who produces what and who gets what. These are the central questions. And if you look at the history, then these are the central questions in the history where we get the civilizational development deciding that who is going to do what and who is going to get what. There are three important ideas involved in it. In the very initial stage, we get two kinds of ideas deciding these two questions. One was the divine, you know, provincial kind of thing, that it is king or, you know, the king is also representative of God. So therefore it is God like caste system uh, or it is a representative of God like king by command. They are going to decide who is going to do what and who is going to get what. So for a long time in history, these questions were revolved around this, that who is going to decide. So king or, or, or God, provincial divinity uh, kind of thing decided that who is going to do what and who is going to get what. Other thing which was dominant in history was about social norms. So we get all kinds of social norms which, which decided that like gender uh, is one question that who is going, you know, how women will be, you know, engaged in these productive activities and what are their, their entitlements over it. So these are the questions, caste, gender and all these things are social norms which actually define the kind of things that are going to be there in the society. So this is these for a long period of time, these are the things, you know, these questions, fundamental questions of human so you know, society organization, where it's revolved around the social, social norms and kings and commands. So the progress was rather very slow. In 19th century, these were replaced by something called market. All right? Market existed before. It's not that market came into existence only after 18th century or 19th century. You get market in the medieval period and even before that. It existed, this is important to understand, it existed as a place of exchange. There was a market and you can buy things, sell things and all these things. Market has never been considered as an institution of social organization prior to 19th century. In 19th century onwards, or 18th century to be precise, the market was considered as something which is going to give you this answer. That who is going to do what and who is going to get what. So that is a remarkable shift in terms of how society is organized. It is coming long way from command and norms to market as an institution. So that is the difference when we talk about market today and we talk about market in the medieval period market in the medieval period not an institution of social organization market today is a social institution organizing the human society so i think that's a very fundamental difference and you need to see i do not have time to spend on this thing uh, but the main point is this that you have to make a, a, a distinction between market today and market before and when we talk about market today and that is why we call this is actually a more of a market society it is market dictating how people are going to engage in productive activities and what by doing that how they are going to get other kind of activities how they claim over other kind of activities even if they are not engaged in their production so therefore this market society is a very new thing coming in 18 19 centuries and this changed this thing and that actually we will try to examine that coming of this market society how it actually helped in standardizing a particular idea of of development now, I will just briefly talk about a very important transition that happened in, in human history and that is the transition from feudalism to capitalism, which market society. Feudal society, pre-market society and then capitalism which is a market society and that transition you need to understand. I do not have time and also uh, probably I do not command that kind of you know, understanding of these two themes as well. 
to tell you about more but just to give a sense what i'm trying to argue is that it started you know from the slave society and 18th century a lot of things happened uh, individual liberty private property and then invisible hand kind of thing so why market was not coming because of certain you know ideas if you look at the history of economics then you will find that individuals rationality are defined in terms of self interest all right so that is a very problematic proposition because if you define rationality in terms of self interest then you try to maximize self interest where most of the times your self self interest is in conflict of other self interest then if you allow that to happen there will be a chaos in the society so that was the common understanding and that resulted in uh, in, in in providing a space for exogenous you know kind of ordering of the society that legitimized order of king that legitimized order of social norm because you cannot allow individuals to pursue their goals in terms of maximizing their utility happiness or whatever and then therefore because they are in always in conflict with each other so therefore there if we allow that to happen then there will be a social chaos so that is why if you want you know if you want to have a social order it always legitimizes an exogenous factor outside factor like king like social norm so that this become does not become a problem and you you put this all society in order now if you want to break away from that then you need to resolve this crisis that even if you are you know self centered and self maximizing then also it is possible to have social order if you can prove that then only you can get away with king that that are away with the social norm and all these things and that is precisely what is done by adam smith the i with the idea of invisible hand the idea of invisible hand adam smith gave was that there is something within the system which prevent this conflict and which he called invisible hand and that is the idea that if you allow people to pursue their own self interest that is not going to create social disorder once that was established and once that was established it paved way for civil liberty movements politically institutionally private property and the economically market as an institution and that replaced the whole order that was there before and put up a system which is a new order so that's the the idea and then we get a modern market society now what happened go back to the first graph that we have shown that how that changed the whole picture the moment we produce you know we engage with specialized production specialized kind of thing producing for the market and that is very important market society produces for the market not for sale you cannot consume everything that you produce you actually put up these things for market and get exchange and you get money and then you, you if money is an entitlement claim for other commodities not being produced by you so that's the system it put in place and once that happened you see the enormous rise in both gdp and gdp per capita industrial you know everybody knows that how industrial production took place and then we have phases of that of course we have some uh, the gaps in between you see that for for a very very long time at a thousand to 1820 this is the incipient stage of 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 industrial revolution uh, it do not get to see any rise of that so more or less society remains stable the commodity remain you know stable the part of it are remain stable and then that what happened the market society came into being you get lot of production coming up market production for market and that led to starting with this and this is the 1870 1870 is the full blown industrial revolution and then you get the enormous increase rise in this and then the world war happened as an intense fight and then there was a collapse and then from 50 to 74 again there was a rise and this is the period and then 74 onward there was a crisis neoliberalism came so that is the trajectory you can see and you can relate what is happening with the history so that is why i said that probably the answer to this kind of fundamental questions one has to go back to the history for lessons and when we can see the things for ourselves now unique feature of this market society is this when market becomes central and all pervasive then you need to define your rationality and exchange afresh newly you have to define now not only import it is important to have maximization of individual interest but it is also including profits and all so therefore that new kind of rationality will come in and production of production for market will require uh, the 
will 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 put the whole idea of growth at the center because when you get more production, it only means growth. So growth technically means more production. So once you put this idea that production is central to human history and progress, and you need actually more production and more you know kind of things, then the essentially what you are talking indirectly that you need growth. So that's the one first thing that moment it become market society. Growth become an inherent component of that society. So more growth is actually more progress. So that that is the first standardization happened. Now, if you want to have more production, obviously you cannot have it manually. So industry becomes central, and infrastructure becomes central. In fact, I believe, and I I, I somewhere argue that if you look at the history of industrial revolution, then you get two phases. One phase was about the industrial production. That is the 1800. Uh, around 1815 to 1854, and that is the period where we concentrated getting more production. You get scientific invention coming up, different machines coming up, replacing the manual production to machine production, and you get more production. It created a different kind of problem that where do you put, you know, sell these products. So, not first phase was concerned about the more production. That is the first phase of industrialization. Second phase of industrialization, which is actually 1850s onwards. Was about the creating the the infrastructure like railways, like you know the, the the transportation, because you need to transport these things to other markets so that it does not become idle. So you have to free this extra production, and that is why industrial revolution got two phases. One is the industrial revolution in the first phase, getting the production done, and the second phase, distributing the production done, which led to kind of colonialism in that phase, and that is why you see a shift. In the Indian history of nationalism, also 1857 onwards, actually it was no longer East India Company; it was actually England's interest. So, therefore, this change in the structure resulted in the political change as well. So, that's a different kind of story, but this is important to understand. So, so what is the idea? Once we put up a system of market production and market society, growth become integral. Once growth become integral, you are putting emphasis on actually industry and infrastructure. So that gets standardized. The, you see the, these things coming up together and emerging as most important thing, desirable thing in the society. Now, next is investment. That is very important to understand. That if you want to have more production, then you need to have more inputs in it. Now, obviously, you cannot have land. Land is fixed. Uh, you cannot have labor. Labor is also fixed. Only thing you can have actually money. So the money becomes very central in producing things, and that is why investment becomes central. And uh, uh, it, it actually created a notion of surplus. Uh, uh, this, this, uh, you know, and then the standard macroeconomic theory. Those who are from economics will find that you have always an identity between saving and investment. Why? Because you cannot allow idle saving. If you break this identity, then it will not lead to any investment. You are only accumulating and accumulating. So therefore, it is not getting invested. So the standard economic theory will say that you cannot have that kind of thing. Whatever you save needs to be invested so that more production takes place, more accumulation takes place, and that is the you know standardization that happened, and uh, that is what is actually the idea. So where from this gets standardized? This is the overpowering emphasis on market production, market society, production growth. It actually creates the standard model of economic development. Producing a converse, anything which is lacking will be converse. So that is how it gets standardized. It is not done purposely. You know, it is not done deliberately. I am not suggesting, but in the process, it gets standardized. So that is very important to understand. And this is the period in the 1950s. You get a different disciplines coming up, which is called development economics. What is development economics? It was not there before. In 19 before 1950, you do not get this term development economics. 1950 to 1970, there was a proliferation of development economics, trying to standardize this idea for all the societies, and that is precisely the problem. What is the problem? Because of certain things, because of historical reasons, following this path, the Western countries actually solved a lot of problems. There was very minimal unemployment. There was very minimal growth around the, the poverty and all those things. So they said that see that we have followed this path and this is the result. And you have all the problems. So unless you follow this model, you cannot solve your problem. 
You get my point? So therefore, what we have, we have different models that how it is to be done. Legitimizing, you have got different theories, and based on that, you get also policies. All right. So these are thrust upon the other countries, which are not following this path. But most importantly, you forget that the role of colonialism during that period that it allowed people to move out of those countries and that is why it gave the unemployment rate down for quite a quite bit, the two decades or so. But if you look at today, then you will see that those countries, the model countries, European countries, are having these problems which were earlier used to be the other countries. Unemployment rate, the inequality, environment like climate change and all, those countries which were saying that you have more unemployment than us and uh, we have solved the problem by following this market-led growth and all these things. So therefore this is a model, you have to follow it and this is the theory and these are the policies by which you can actually solve your problem are now facing the unemployment of their own which are very high compared to our countries. Inequality is much more than us. Environment problem is much more than us. So therefore if you look at this then the question definitely, that is the second argument for me, is that why do you need retreating development? Because there is a reversal happening. We should actually question that whether you serve still as a model for us. The things that you want promised us are now there. So therefore, can these countries serve as a model? Can their theories actually be applicable? Can their theories answer our questions and all these things? So that's the question and that is why probably we need to rethink this, this, what has happened in between, which has actually changed the face of development discourse over the last 30 or 40 years. Just to give you a sense, all right, the, you look at the global unemployment rate, just looking at the you know, numbers, you will find that this is the South Asia, 3.8%. All right? And all other countries following market-led growth model are having more than us. So in 70s, 60s, those countries were telling that you have more unemployment than, rate than us. So follow us. So we follow. And they become more unemployed than us. So, you know, that is the thing that has happened over the last 40, 30 years. So legitimately one can ask whether that kind of theory or that kind of model can actually serve for our purpose. So that's the first thing. Second thing, the enormous inequality, which I showed in the second graph, where the share of profit actually increased and share of wage has declined. And most of us belong to that category. We are not corporates, we are not capitalists. So we do not get to see that our incomes rising at the same proportion with the, those people. So our incomes are actually declining. So we are getting more impoverished. So that is the thing happening there. Uh, one percent, you know, people owning the fifty percent of the total output. That is the claim. So that is happening, and environment is already there. Now, the the point is, you know, the why, even if that is there, we continue that model, that theory, and that that is there. So how, how they continue to hegemonize this theory upon us? So I would like to argue that there is a systematic hegemony. There is a systematic hegemony by which we do not question their model, we do not question their theory, and we continue to follow, even if, suppose, they fail on themselves, like following the same model for themselves. All right? So that is the question and how that is done. So that is the, by creating certain fallacies. What is the fallacies? The first fallacy is that the common textbook understanding of development tries to carry forward the certain fallacies which are completely historical and first factually wrong. All right, what are these things? Four things in textbook of development economics. First of all, it will project that process of capital accumulation or investment or development is a very naive and peaceful process. You invest and then you get profit. In the history, it has never happened. Factually, that has never happened. That process of accumulation is always accompanied by a process of huge disposition. Always. It started with enclosure movement in the history, it's still continuing. So development, the projection of development as a peaceful naive process is actually wrong. It is neither proved in history nor in the contemporary times. The development always has a accompanying tendency of dispossession and that is one, uh, one needs to be understood. 
A second fallacy is that as if capital grows only through investment. No, capital can go by other means, like encroachment, grabbing. This always happens, so it is not only a very benign kind of investment that only allows capital to grow. It has never happened, not at the present time, it is not going to happen in the future. So it is not historical, it is not factual. Second most dangerous thing is that capital is a self-contained process. You know, this development is a self-contained process. Suppose you cannot develop all by yourself. Alright? So that is, a, you know, I think important to understand. It has never been a self-contained process. And most importantly, it is, it is an embedded process. It is not an autonomous process. Because, and that is the you know, problem. Because if you want to distribute development in different settings, then you are not going to get development. Because that setting, that institution, that society is not ready to accept that. So therefore, thinking that development is detached from those institutions, detached from social conditions, it, it is not embedded, it is autonomous something, and it is actually self-content, is grossly, grossly misleading and wrong, and that is probably we need to understand, and that is probably we need to the question. I would suggest that there is always a dialectical relation between development and underdevelopment. It was happened during the period of colonialism and imperialism in history, and at present phase of you know this development, underdevelopment hegemony is being done by the process of globalization. So that's my kind of argument, and that is my kind of understanding. I will explain why. In the colonialism, you get two sets of people: one are colonizers, and other one is colonized. Similarly, today we have two sets of people: one is globalizers another one is globalized. Think about it. Have you been able to globalize and influence culturally, economically other societies? No. You are not being able to do that. You are actually more globalized than globalizer. So therefore, this dichotomy between you know, development and underdevelopment, which actually facilitated by this idea of colonialism and imperialism, is recontinued with the idea of globalization. It is rebranded as this difference as a, in the eyes of the, you know, globalization. Um, and that is why I would like to put certain maps. This is a map of the colonies and colonizers in 1914 during the First World War. You should look at the colonies and colonizers. Alright? What are the colonies and colonizers? You impose the same map on the development map today. You find that those colonizers are developed countries and those colonies are actually the underdeveloped countries. You reimpose this map on the Human Development Index map, you will find the same match coming up that the, those countries which are colonizers and develop are also enjoying the human development. Those countries which are colonies and the, you know, the, the less developed, so-called less developed, as identified by World Bank and IMF, are also the countries with the less amount of human development in this. So how do you say that there is no connection and these are autonomous events in the history? It has never been like that and there is a whole lot of literature on that. So therefore I would like to suggest that it is wrong to understand development is a something which is a autonomous self-contained system. It is always dialectic. It is always to be seen in terms of other countries and other institutions. And that is how it is to be think, you know, thought of. Um, I would like to end by and you know the suggesting some alternative. First of all, uh, I think this A A is the first one. A B C D. Four things I would like to suggest. First one, we need to actually um, recognize the process of capital accumulation along with disposition. First, let us recognize that this systemic hegemony you know, carried forward by the idea that this capital expansion, growth and all these things are very naive and peaceful process. We need to recognize that it has not been like that. It is not today and it is not going to be in the future. Very unlikely that it is going to be in the future. So therefore, let us recognize this process of development has a tendency of disposition and that is what we need to recognize first. Second point, um, is that if you, if, you, if, you, if you allow that to happen, then obviously you need to talk about certain protection in terms of right for all those people who are having the chance of getting dispossessed. All right? If you want to protect them, and if you recognize that there is a potential danger for you know, you know, the, the, the dispossession, then what is the essential you know, duty? Then you need to protect those sections, and that is you section. 
That is a huge section of population. So you need to talk about their rights, you need to talk about their you know, condition, and that is why, rather than putting idea of development on them, we should also ask them that what is their idea of development, how they want to have developed, and that is how you need to take on, uh, on board them, and then think about certain set of protections and rights. There is a great deal of difference. Think about labor. Neoclassical economics will say that labor is a factor of production, input of production. And also say that anything given to labor is a cost. Get my point? So if you think that they are actually factor of production, anything given to them will constitute cost. Neoclassical you know, rationality will demand that you minimize the cost. Minimize the cost. And what will the, what will the consequence? That you will not give anything to labor. Because you are considering them as a factor of production. So therefore, the moment I go by this idea, neoclassical idea of factor of production, Immediately, there is a tendency of not giving anything to them because it is going to, you know, add to cost. So you will try to rationalize your action by minimizing the cost, labor ending up in more precarious condition than ever before. So that's the idea. Change it to right-based kind of thing. Consider, laborers are not only factors of production, they are also citizens of the country. So they have the right of health, they have the right of education, they have the right of income and so on and so forth. And moment we consider that these are not kind of benign or the unanimated kind of factors of production, these are human beings with citizens' right, then with that perspective will change to end up with the citizens that they actually should have. So it is not minimizing the cost by giving them certain rights, it is actually maximizing the rights for them. So therefore, there is a need to change this perspective from neoclassical framework, which is a dominant strategy, which I already you know, explained to a perspective which is more human, more people-centric, more right-based, more citizenry-centric, then probably we can... But that will require the first condition that you should recognize that there is a possibility of getting this process. Then you talk about rights for protection and all these things. So that's there. So if we'd like to do that, you need to think about in terms of a new kind of welfare state. Who is going to grant right? State is going to grant right. So what kind of state? Welfare state. You cannot have the original kind of welfare state. Now the problem today is that we have a projection that any state which is doing a lot of you know, welfare schemes or welfare state. No. That's not the proper idea of welfare state. What is the welfare state? The welfare state, the essential duty of welfare state is to actually address the income inequality. Those who are from political science will understand Article 38 and 39 prevents in India the income inequality. Of course it is a directive principle of the state. But Article 38 and 39 specifically talks about that you cannot allow income inequality in the country. It is the responsibility of the state to actually curtail the kind of income inequality within the country. It should take all the you know, states for curbing that kind of income inequality. So therefore, this is very important to understand. So you have to talk about those things today. It is even more important today to talk about the directive principle Article number 38 and 39. So there is a space. We need only the political mobility, you know, mobilization and political will. Now, lastly, probably, we should talk about the new dynamics of redistribution. What is the new dynamics of redistribution and inequality? If you look at the inequality diagram I have shown, then you will find that there is an enormous transfer already happened, you know, from the lowest bottom to the top bottom. So these pores are cannot be squeezed further because they are in the subsistence level it is not possible to get anything out of them. So if you want to continue that inequality and this distribution, then you have to target the middle class. And you will find that in you know, middle class are today is the target. We are the people who are getting sufferers. So therefore, discourse only restricting only on those subaltern marginalized section is not going to get, uh, get us anything out. It is actually need to try to talk to people like us you know, understanding what is happening around us, and that is the new dynamics. That when the bottom part is exhausting, the squeezing part, now the target is actually in between. So there will be increasing pressure on middle class, and that has already happened. You know, for instance, suppose the, the you know the labor courts. If you look at the labor courts, the way the labor courts are being structured, the way the rights are being started, the age pay commission will not be there anymore. So therefore, it is now it's the middle class from where this transfer of income will happen to the top. So therefore, you have to be very ready. So you need to understand the new dynamics of inequality and redistribution, and that is how probably we need to uh, you know, rethink about development processes and so on and so forth. Now, 
the, I will come to the first questions that is there any legitimate reasons to rethink about development? I suggest that yes, there is a great deal of uh, legitimate reasons for rethinking about development. And how should we rethink? It is actually rethinking will require certain things, recognizing the possibility of disposition, protecting the rights of those who dispose, understanding the, 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 the new kind of dynamics for redistribution and inequality, and, and most importantly, the thinking about a new kind of welfare state which is going to do this. So that's the answer, and with this I end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for your enlightening and insightful lecture. Uh, it will, uh, it definitely motivate us to study the different prospect of development in new manner. Now, uh, I definitely, uh, uh, I definitely have many questions in my mind also. I think you have also questions. So now the floor is open uh, for discussions. You please participate. So let me ask the first questions. Uh, uh, we know development is a continuous process. Uh, and uh, if we uh, if we uh, set the Indian scenario, uh, definitely there is uh, there is development. But uh, presently, the the uh, the wealth or the fruits of development are mainly concentrating uh, in a in few hands or in a minority groups of people. Is this a proper development, or is this a development in two sense? Well, I think I have already answered that through my you know, presentation that this is not. And then the, this is not, but only thing is that you are getting the same results across the countries, across the societies, because you are being forced to follow the same set of theories and policies. You will get hardly any country pursuing different economic agenda and economic policies today. Most of the countries, if you look at, then you will find that same set of policies, same set of you know, theories are there. Uh, we taught same set of theories, we pursue same set of policies and no wonder that you are getting the same outcome or result. So therefore, and that is what is to be questioned that whether this is a good idea that irrespective of your society, social condition, institutions, you simply follow a single standard set of development theory, model and policy and trying to solve your problem which has nothing to do with this kind of, you know, the, it is nowhere linked to the idea of, of, of society. And that is the problem and that is why I suggested that probably it is high time that we should rethink about our own development agenda, what should be our own agenda and how this is to be pursued, not dictated by anybody else but by ourselves. And that can happen only when you exercise a political rights in terms of citizenry so that this agency role of individuals comes in and they take part actively in deciding the fate of them for themselves. So that's the you know, kind of an answer that probably I would like to give. Time to explain, or at least time to explain 
the first the rural urban differences um, the urban is actually part of standardization all right part of standardization for quite some time during the 50s and 60s that was not there at least in india uh, because we break we tried to break away from that standardization uh, so there were different policies for that but then rather we tried to do what we had a policy for industrial dispersal all right what we thought that probably we should actually have industries in remote areas and that is why we got industries in borwa bamungao silghat and all those few things these are not urban areas understanding was that if we put up industry in villages then it will actually develop those villages and then you know the, the related villages and that will be more equity all right that will be more equity and then regional disparity will be reduced so target was to put up industries in villages put up industries in areas which are not being development and that is the discourse dominant discourse in india in 60s and 70s which we call regional disparity discourse and simultaneously we thought of also improving the rural quality of life so that people do not come and you know flock around the urban areas so we thought of lot of programs for rural areas as well um in, including the you know green revolution increasing the productivity giving income uh, in agricultural prices commission uh, for giving good income to the the farmers and all and that continued in 60s and 70s uh, so th these are the two point strategies on one hand how do you bridge this gap between rural and urban that you try to improve the urban quality of life so that they do not migrate to urban area that is one second you also put up industries in villages and rural areas so that that development which is already concentrated in urban areas get diffused to rural areas as well and you thereby you bridge the gap between these two the so two strategies uh then uh in 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 uh in the modern in the contemporary phase you actually replace this whole idea of industrial dispersal to urban renewal okay this whole urban renewal means that you concentrate only on few urban areas like you know 100 smart cities or 500 smart cities so you actually shift this focus from equity to efficiency the idea was that uh, if you have limited resources you cannot end up spending everywhere where it is not a good result you will try to put up this money where results are high so therefore it is an efficiency so therefore when that kind of neo classical profit maximizing principle comes into place uh, in, 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 as a neoliberal policy then we forget about this equity forget about all those things and we try to select the most important areas for investment like 100 smart cities 500 smart cities and so on and so forth and we have come up with a program called urban renewal the my phd relates to that so i can tell you that process of urbanization in most of the indian towns and cities are different from process of urbanization of the towns and cities in the european countries ours is not a process of economic urbanization what is the urbanization the space capital relation there is a space and there is a capital capital comes to particular space location puts up the industry and so on and so forth and then you, you you have the industrial population coming up so you get more urban features than agriculture ours is not that ours is not economic towns ours is not economic you know the urban areas it is administrative towns and urban areas which are district headquarters of colonial times subdivisional headquarters of colonial times it has nothing to do with any economic process like space capital relation so you just import that idea and put up in indian indian system it will only create rural urban gap rather than bridging them so therefore this is one way of looking at this gap today and that is what you need to understand the second idea which you talked about regarding this uh, disposition in villages and an agriculture and all these things i think it, it is it is it is a little bit complex thing the traditional theory will tell you that if there is a migration happening from the agriculture to non agriculture it is actually development and that is the classic todaro model you know the uh, louis model louisian transformation that agriculture has lot of uh, disguised unemployment so therefore productivity is very low if it is good that if people are coming out of agriculture and then they are in other sectors where their income is high and that has been written by many people including karl polanyi in 1950s which is called great transformation now it is is it so we need to ask this question to our agricultural situation as well so i think no 
it is not because this transformation is not happening because we have reached a optimum in agriculture we have not reached in optimum in agriculture we have uncultivated land assam irrigation you know the total area cultivated irrigation percentage is actually 4.3 percent out of total cultivated area you are having irrigation only in 4.3 percent of gross cultivation area so it's not reached the optimum that people are now being disguisedly employed and therefore they are coming out it is actually uh, two things happening it is an enormous income squeeze in the in the rural areas one is being done by one process increasing cost of inputs and not giving prices so therefore income falls and also you know as a, as a policy you are monetizing a lot of services which were either earlier provided by the state uh, like education health become increasingly costly so therefore two squeeze happening one is the cost price squeeze in the agricultural product and second other active other expenses for individuals are also growing so you are finding that agriculture is no more remunerative and people are coming out not that they are coming out of the optimum level already achieved so therefore you need to understand these processes if you want to make sense of it and then you know then you will be able to you know relate this why there is a squeeze in, in income happening that is a precisely because of neoliberal policies and all you can easily link that the how why cost of inputs are growing by the way i i can give you one data for assam the fertilizer cost in assam from uh, 2006 uh, no 96 to 2016 have increased by 377 percent over 20 years the fertilizer cost in assam per hectare of paddy cultivation increased by 377%. What is the price increase? It is actually 11%. So cost is increasing by more than 50 times. Price is increasing only by 11 times. The think about the squeeze that is happening in earning in the agriculture sector. So therefore, it is important and then you link it up to the subsidy to the fertilizers and all, then you will find. There is a you know, debate going on that what kind of things government should give free? Get my point? What kinds of things government should give free? So that is an interesting debate. I do not want to go into that debate, but the withdrawal of subsidy, withdrawal of these things are to be relooked because it is a different context. It, we are not having an agriculture which is like you know the America or which is like New Zealand or which is like Australia. We are having our own set. Even within India, we have a very peculiar kind of you know land holding. What is the average size of land holding in Assam? It is actually less than one hectare. Average. And I am talking about the operational holding, not the ownership holding. Ownership holding is less. So if you combine new, your land and taken on you know, this, this tenancy, then also it is going to be less than one hectare. So one hectare land, what is the absorption capacity of cost? It's very less. So if you go on increasing the cost and land size does not increase, it is uneconomic for all farmers. So you, you have to think about, and that is my suggestion, is that you go to people, talk to them, find out solution, taking them on board, rather than saying that, okay, this is the you know, thing that this has worked elsewhere, so it is going to work for you as well. I think if you pursue like that, and the most dangerous thing is that, that there is an argument that why we have problem, because the reforms are not enough. Get my point? The reforms are the problem sometimes. You are trying to do certain things, it is already creating problem and you think that it is not sufficient and therefore you want to even more reform. And that is not going to solve the problem, it will give you more problems. So therefore this argument that not having enough reform is also rather problematic. So these are the you know, things probably you can look at and then we can examine. Thank you Professor Jorge for that wonderful lecture and the subsequent deliberations. <coughs> Uh, in your presentation, in one of the slides, there was uh, a graph in which the GDP and per capita across decades yeah, it was shown. And I just noted down of one, uh, to one figures of 1950 to 1970. There was a sharp increase. Uh, 1950 to 19, this one. 1950 to 1974, this portion. And if we just contextualize it with our own country, say 
we adopted the planned economy model. Then, it was the 1960s, we just embraced the green revolution. Then onwards, we started embracing a model, something like go rural. Go rural. That go rural was mostly in terms of agriculture, fertilizer, and all those. But mostly the concentration was on urban, public sector, like the commanding heights of yeah. the economy, like those things. The 1980s onwards only, the kind of concept which you advocated or you presented was in the modern market society as a social organization. That started emerging. And so, though uh, different contextual references have been made in terms of imposition of some of the ideas from the <coughs> otherwise developed countries, but the colonialized are on those to our context. But our mode of development basically we did not have a choice. We got independence, we adopted planned economies model, 1990s onwards, LPGs, those came inevitably. And alongside that go rural campaign, go rural, and go rural not only in terms of the development of programs by the government, in terms of agriculture, green revolution, and all other things. So that the same theoretical paradigm which he presented the production and market, that who produces what and who gets what. So who produces what? It's mostly in 1980s, 90s, is the urban producing. So the slave was urban to rural, urban to rural, and from rural to urban, it was mostly people. <coughs> that migration, and uh, some rural artisans products and do makeup like that. It was mostly urban to rural. So they are kind of things that we have experienced over this historical period. It was inevitable. It came inevitably, automatically it came. But subsequently, it also has resulted in more growth, more progress alongside the uh, this inequalities as well. And because the investment came in terms of industry, infrastructure and investment. So with this, the kind of central argument that you posed about rethinking development, so it, that you also talked about provoked us to think about the new rationality. So the new rationality in terms of this inequalities and all those plus the sociological aspects, as if the rural is losing its rural character. Yeah. Rural is losing its rural character by embracing the model of go rural. Going, by going rural, the rural is losing its rural character and we are having a developed market and some to say, some people might also say that we are having a developed market, we are having the underdeveloped market. So maybe if you want to be the alternative paradigm, we do not have the answer because we are moving to a big time. That's the comment I would like. Yeah, I think I would like to respond very quickly to that. One is that um, this, this is a global data which also includes the Indian data and Indian data will also be the like same as you have suggested. Um, and that is the, this is the period 1950s and 1960s and up to 1973 actually. Uh, you get the same kind of trend across the globe. And, uh, uh, and that is the period for which Kyle Polanyi has written this great transformation. The one argument is that uh, what has happened actually? How this kind of growth took place during that period? The, the idea was that, and that is the, the period where there was a lot of investment, there was a compromise uh, between the labor and capital in, in a very broad sense. What is the labor and capital compromise? That profit share was shared with the labor in terms of cost for their education and health during the 50s and 60s, um, which resulted in increasing productivity of labor during that period. So the people understood that if you invest in labor and make them happy and good life, and then the productivity will increase, which will actually create more profit for the converts as well. So there was a kind of understanding, and that is the endogenous growth theories of that during that period, explaining what is happening, 50s and 60s, they're suggesting that you need to have, you cannot have enormous profit because it is you are coming up with second world war, the world is not that you know kind of thing, 
it is very fragile so you do not have historical context for very persuasive and aggressive kind of competition so what you come up with a design that there is a compromise happening that you share certain amount of profit with the labor invest them in in, 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 in increasing their productivity in terms of investment in health and education and in turn their productivity will increase which will also contribute to the 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 profit and if you look at the historical data this is precisely the period where only in the history for the only only exception in the history where you get both profit and wages going up this is the history in 1950s and 1960s so and and that is where uh, people talked about great transformation there's something unique happening contrary to the idea that profit will grow at the expense of wages that is not happening and because of this investment in labor the both wage share and profit share increased and that is classified as a golden period of capitalism and that is the precisely the period and that is explained india of course has a different you know you know context you yeah, you got independence um, in during the independence you have a development also has a political content you promise lot of artisans lot of you know farmers that to end their you know sufferings in terms of colonial exploitation and so on and so forth so series of protection measures were also given to those artisans those peasants and those farmers as well so during the 50s and 60s you get lot of land reforms lot of you know the you know, you know, ideas where the idea was this is the nehru's idea of in, you know the economic policy somehow the colonialism all about exposing your you know people to the global market and vulnerabilities of the global market this if you want to reverse that you have to insulate the the exposure of those petty producing sector from the global market and that is precisely nehru did through a series of protection which somehow helped uh, those petty producing class during 1950s and 60s and uh, the india could also sort of improve situation which produced lot of you know capital and surplus for investment and to project to have a project like green revolution for instance now today the crisis of agriculture in assam is that you are having so less income that you are hardly left with any investment for agricultural expansion you do not get so only state can invest so if state is not investing in irrigation state is not providing any you know kind of thing there is no way by which private capital can be invested because you don't have capital similar was the case with the, uh, the 50s and 60s you look at the agricultural spending of indian government in 50s and 60s enormous spending was done providing some income protection was done and thereby improving certain conditions and then providing a platform or at least ground to have green revolution in 1960 64 to be precise so that's the you know kind of thing so india had the same kind of trajectory of course with a different kind of thing and the world had this compromise coming in in general uh, in terms of wage and uh, profit share and that is where and then endogenous growth theory coming in and then giving this kind of boost in that particular period so that's the broad understanding probably one has to look into good afternoon uh, uh, i i do not have a query as such uh, because many of the areas presented today are almost greek to me but whatever was english from that i have a little understanding uh, first of all uh, it reminded me this experience of this presentation reminded me of a military general he was the deputy commandant in pentagon and he was talking to us on american military policy in south asia the resemblance is first resemblance he was as tall as joyde second almost like joyde he was an ultra thin entity and third in terms of content as joyde talked to us this evening with the highest level of confidence in his command that was the similar confidence with which the deputy commandant of pentagon was speaking here you see 
there was the similarity part coming to the part that i understood i find one part that is my understanding is a kind of maximum satisfaction in minimum time next observation i remember a philosopher in the utilitarian school of thought Jeremy Bentham. Jeremy Bentham. Jeremy Bentham. Jeremy Bentham. In his, there was the maximum satisfaction for the maximum number. That was the Western political thought. In Indian scenario of development, what do you find in Japanese philosophy? Satisfaction for all. That is the philosophy of Sorbonne. Do you find a kind of similarity in your whole philosophy of new welfare state to that of the philosophy of welfareism that was initiated by J.P. Dalian in the form of Sorbonne? Okay, so uh, partly yes and partly no. Uh, as an ideology, I think there is a close resemblance what I am speaking about to JP's idea of surveillance, it inclusiveness, democracy, and so and so forth. So that part is, uh, I think, uh, is okay. To my understanding, JP's idea was not a very right-based approach, but it was more of a voluntary kind of thing. And there I differ. I do not see a very great scope for volunteerism bringing aid to the suffering of people. You need organized movement and organized activities, political mobilization, in terms of people's right to end this kind of hegemony. JP was having a different context. JP's idea was different. He was not fighting with this kind of hegemonic economic financial order where certain things were possible by exercising country's own individual agency and so forth so forth which i do not see a great possibility today so only possibility today is actually is probably to have a larger mobilization along the rights of people to out come, you know, come out of this kind of trap that we are having so that's the difference so therefore partly yes in terms of ideology not in terms of tactics, probably JP would have followed. So it was a very nice presentation from Dr. Burwa. So compliments on that. <coughs> Economics is not my cup of tea. But what you have presented is we have come to know various aspects of economics. When you have said that um, the rethinking development Uh, the title itself, whether it is thinking development or thinking economic development. When it comes to development, there are many kinds of developments, and sure. many perspectives are there. So, cultural development, education, and different aspects are there. So, when uh, we have to rethink about development, along with the economic development, we have to think about the other aspects. So, when it comes to the other perspective, there may be certain contradictions with the economics. There may not be always balanced. So, uh, I think that may be one observation in your part. But I always say economic development part, what we have to do from your side, uh, it gives you a very good understanding about the economic points of development. Only my observation was that, that we have to think at a total development. Yeah, sure. That might be. Thank you.
I find it striking similarity between the his theory of distributive justice and the need to reason in development that is going to be. And then uh, another part I focus on uh, about today is that uh, is uh, yeah, sir, you have already mentioned that we need to have proactive civil society because in the face of the onslaught of the neoliberal liberal agenda, I mean, uh, and uh, the, the state is almost the political sovereignty has become subservient to the market uh, yeah. forces. So in that case, I think the civil, uh, activation of the civil society is the only way of as it comes out. And so regarding John Rox's uh, analogy between John Rox's theory of restrictive justice and your idea of revisiting or having to revisit development, could uh, there be uh, some similarity between the two? I find striking resemblance between the two. Yeah, I mean, uh, you, will be, you will be seeing some, some similarity because distributive justice idea will emerge only when there is a distributive injustice. And pre precisely that was I was talking about that there is an enormous inequality happening in terms of share of wealth uh, collectively and individually. So therefore, there is a ground for thinking about redistributive justice. Uh, you can have different positions of redistributive justice. Rawls is one of them, but not the only one. You know, that you have other versions of distributive justice as well. So there is a great scope for it. So I completely agree on that. And last point probably. Uh, that you have talked about that political sovereignty and economic sovereignty i think that's a that's a very interesting point i elsewhere argue very forcefully wherever i can that what is the difference between the earlier regime and this regime the, in the earlier regime there was no difference between political sovereignty and economic sovereignty you can pursue the economic policies if you are sovereign country sovereign society or so on so forth now the difference is that that there is a compromise happening and it is increasingly putting compromise that political sovereignty and economic sovereignty no longer co terminus that not necessary that political sovereign country will be equally sovereign to pursue the policies that they want to pursue and that happened in greek you know you remember recall the syriza government and all those things that they were thrown out because they want to have their own sets of policies so it's not possible and, 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 and during that period of time i was in athens in 19, 2014 i was actually in athens uh, attending a conference and attending a course. So I was there for a month. So I was seeing uh, prior to election what was happening. There was a square like Devalipukuri here in the Sintangma square. People gathered, shouted, you know, then I also participated in sort of like thing, you don't know in Greek also. So that's the you know, kind of thing that was happening. So you know that it is there, that there is a distinction between political sovereignty and economic sovereignty. Even if you are politically sovereign, you cannot actually pursue the set of economic policies. And that is a problem. And that is precisely the problem and that is where, uh, that is a systemic hegemony I was talking about and that has been created and that has been operated upon, that has been strengthened. So the only way out is actually to realize that this is happening and then exert the political right that this is actually uh, to be reversed. So that's the idea I was trying to you know, pass. Uh, Jody, <coughs> I should you because you have given a brainstorming session and I'm enjoying it because for the last uh, almost two years, I have been out of the whole session because I am working in different field. Though I am a student of economics, actually, uh, I am not putting any observation or all questions or to you from this perspective. I uh, want to know from the very, uh, you know, just layman's perspective of development. So, if you ask anybody that what is development, you will get that answer it very simple. I am happy because of this. This is called development. Very, you know, you know if you ask this sort of question, come on then. So, I have observed that the development theories will be always developing because there will be no end of this except continuous process. There will be new models of development in different situations, different societies. The perception is always different. You know, when you see that it is developed in a particular community, they may not think that we are developed. So, these contradictions is always there. Political, you know, influences are here and the civil rights uh, governments all because that overall you may have to consider all those things to give a right kind of model for development so there you have from your observation and we agree that the criminal year society is always benefited from the whatever the uh, source schemes and all we have observed it and say there are marginalization or the right such as inclusiveness comes in our even our parents also uh, but even then, we find the differences. There are inequalities are getting more and more inequalities. We find them in society. Even 
if you find that the Islam, even right now, that we understand, and even it is uh, going uh, in the discussion, that the whole you know country's resources are now now in the hands of few people. That this is not good for the democracy and even that. But for the economists also, they have different theories, they will support it. So there will be contradictions always. And I think this will continue. But there will be changes of everything. Your Marxian theories are also changing. Economic uh, uh, theory of uh, capitalism also changing. Because this is a must that it will continue to change. I find a bit, uh, I want to focus on the uh, government here in particular, the conflicts. The political interest is important because development of the whole thing for five years, particular one political, you know, uh, uh, that means uh, party will consider thing the development part. So then another five years, a new political will come up. They will think in different policies they will going to implement. There will be conflicts in between that. Say for example, the social uh, the, 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 the dark projects or whatever single projects, even Kolkata, even in our some such projects, all civilized activities. The social cost is involved in development. The there is two things: developmental part and the social cost is involved. I would like to give focus on the social. How do you like to reconcile these two? Because growth is important, development is important. We have to think of the social cost too as well. So please go on this. Yeah, I, I think um, I don't know how I'll be able to respond to this, but my take will be like this. Uh, there are two you know, questions involved. One is an academic. That what should be the role of academic in whole this exercise? And second, what is the role of the what will be the role of those who practice development or pursue development policy makes policies for them? So that's a government or other agencies to do. The for academics, I think that we need to realize that we are uh, trying to understand the development in a very homogeneous way, which is not. So that's the first point. Uh, that realization is missing these days. All the, uh, now the syllabus will be given by UGC, you know. So the, you have an architecture for that, homogenizing the ideas and knowledge. So APIs are there, so you will write only to select list of journals. So you, there is no option that you can write elsewhere. It will not be counted. Though journal will be, you know, saying that, okay, you are writing this thing, we will not publish it. So you will write only the one kind of story that will circulate, that will revolve around, it will create a peer, it will get credited. So you are having a cool, good architecture in academic cycle, which actually complements this kind of standardization. We need to realize and somehow come out of this. So that's the you know, first part. And that was precisely one part of the purpose of this talk. Second purpose was about the, the practices. You know, how do you reconcile the social cost in this? You know, the, I had the opportunity of evaluating some of the social cost projects, including the governor's house. You know, the, the cost benefit analysis was done by me. <coughs> the standard World Bank manual says that rehabilitation cost should be a part of you know, the project cost. You have to make this, Sarah will be probably knowing that rehabilitation cost should be a part of the project cost. Now, if you increase the project cost by giving more rehabilitation, then your economic cost benefit analysis will go you know, towards negative. So, if you want to pursue the project, get my point, what we will do? Try to reduce the project cost. Then only the economic benefit will emerge, so social cost benefit in, in economy emerge. So, all physical kind of thing you cannot reduce because this structure is given. So, the maximum compromise is done on the rehabilitation part. So you give minimum rehabilitation package to keep this project cost low in order to make internal rate of return high so that projects becomes viable and then end up having a all kind of you know, political manifestation of this kind. So it's very simple. You simply make a lobby and that is what is the right. That you, if you consider that this is actually a project cost, which is neoclassical rationality, it requires minimization of cost. If you forego that, and consider this individual says right, you simply put this cost out of the project cost and treat it separately. That can be done by the academic people. We can actually form lobbies and when I was there, I tried to lobby this, that it cannot be a part of project cost. It is a different kind of cost altogether. It is a right of people. Then if it is a right, it is not factor of production. Then how can you combine this right cost with a factor of production cost? So you have to separate it out. Moment you separate it out, this rehabilitation package from the project cost, 
then it is perfectly possible to give a good deal of you know rehabilitation package it is now no way it is linked to the project cost you can still have high you know internal return so that's how there is a role of academy in reconciling this kind of conflicts and there are other roles as well which you can actually do in the government circle as well. so but only thing is that you need to understand recognize where the problem is and this is the problem that people are considered as unanimated factor of production in the standard neoclassical framework and that is where the problem is if you consider them as citizen people then you have a whole different kind of understanding uh, in treating these problems and reconciling it i think that's the fundamental thing probably we need to think about and that is what i was suggesting uh, yeah uh, uh, so we are rethinking <coughs> of development uh, the why query is that can we think of development uh, in a same like mode can we think of development in a same like mode so uh, my thought is like that so we are perceiving development in terms of new we are perceiving development in terms of new buildings we are perceiving development in terms of technology but in contrast to this we are not perceiving development in terms of agriculture we are not perceiving development in terms of education so can we think that the point that I am asking that the problem is like a same world even not of the same is broken then how can we think of development how can we think how can we rethink of rethinking of development Okay, so I don't have anything to dispute with that. I mean, the uh, perfectly fine for me, uh, and that is the precisely is the point. Uh, and that is why I said that people have their own ideas of development. So it is important to go back to, to people and ask what development means for them. Bhutan has done that exercise. I I, I had an opportunity of uh, involved in that exercise as well. Gross happiness report. Uh, Bhutan has done that exercise. They went to people, ask what are the important things for them, and then trying to do. But Bhutan is a different society, more or less homogeneous. Ours is a quite different. You know, I give you one or two examples. You know, the when Lucas policy happened, and that will probably give you the answer. When Lucas policy happened, there was a effort of developing infrastructure in terms of logistics. You know, roads, you know, bridges, connectivity, and so on and so forth. and uh, there was a proposal for a road six lane highway from the town samphai in mizoram to jokathar which is a point of 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 myanmar and india six lane highway and i visited there and i i could see that it is actually hill and then if you want to have a six lane highway you have to dismantle entire hill because in that slope only single highway is possible if you want to extend that to two lane three lane four lane then you have to actually cut down the hill completely and then you can have only that road like this so that why that is happening because you try to project a six lane highway as a good road which is not good for hills you have not you know discussed about the terrain you have not talked about the slopes you have not talked about anything with your physical features you have not talked to people you have projected that you need to have a good logistic six lane highway container movement big trucks the they should move they cannot move because this is hill then my point so that is the idea of development that we have that is the standardized idea of development had and that i am contesting instead of this you look at the source of drinking water of champai town if after 80 years of independence your state is not being able to provide a a clean glass of water and that has been compensated by a six lane highway cutting down the hills i think there is a serious problem of development and we need to really introspect and rethink about it now uh, we come to the conclusion of this uh, talk uh, i thank uh, bobo sir for nicely uh, for nice and timely presentations i uh, i think uh, i thank uh, everyone for participating Uh, in this program and uh, lastly uh, i think uh, authority of our university for uh, giving us the opportunity to organize this program i do hope we can continue 
this traditions uh, with your kind cooperation. Thank you very much.